I am here at the uh, um, Pioneer Square right now, and um, it is May 1st, 2014, and um, this is the dining. This is the uh, downtown area. There's hardly anybody out here. Uh, there's uh, something going on over there. Not sure what it is, um, but this is pretty much it at the beginning of May. I am holding my Bible. This is my first time preaching out of this Bible. I usually use the other evangelistic Bible, but this one I'm using now, and I'm going to um, preach for about five minutes or so, and hopefully uh, God will use this message to touch the, uh, the people's heart uh, for his son's name's sake. I'm reading Psalm 139. Father, I pray this afternoon just that you would... Um, work in the heart of the people, and that they would um, hear the message and repent. In Jesus' name, amen. Psalms 139, verses 1 to 24. According to the Bible, it was written by David the King. It's a four-part psalm that talks about the all-knowing God, the God of omnipresence, who's everywhere, a God of omniscience who knows everything. And then David's conclusion to those who are his enemies and those who hate him. So this Old Testament passage was written by King David. He was the second king of Israel. Now why would I be teaching this Old Testament passage in the 21st century I think it's a message that we all need to remember as we live our lives as Americans that we have a living God above us who's not only shining the sun in our faces, over our businesses, over our lives, we have a God who knows everything that there is to know about us, a God who is everywhere, a God who has all power, and it is this Hebrew king who turns to God and reminds himself of these three attributes of God in the midst of difficulty, persecution, war with his enemies. He reminds himself that God is the God who is everywhere. God is the God who knows everything. God is a God who has all power and all authority. Even though God may not come down and speak to you and me when we are in the midst of the fire, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was, or like Daniel who was in the lion's den, yet God allows us to understand his attribute, which is invisible. You cannot see the hand of God unless you look at creation. You cannot understand the mind of God unless you begin to reason in your mind the scriptures. So what does David say about these three attributes of God and why does it comfort him? David writes and Israel reads and now the New Testament reads also, O Lord, Thou hast searched me and know me. Thou dost know when I sit down and when I rise up. Thou dost scrutinize my path and my lying down, and art intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there is a word on my tongue, Behold, O Lord, Thou dost know it all. Thou hast enclosed me behind and before. 
and laid thy hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high, I cannot attain to it. David says, you know everything. You know when I sit down, you know when I rise up. I can't hide from you. My thoughts, my desires, my struggles, my wars. What is it that God does not know about each one of us today? What part of this passage does not apply to us in the 21st century, in every century before, in every century that will come after? God knows everything. There's absolutely nothing that he does not know. If you're going through a trial, and you call on the name of the Lord, and he doesn't answer you, there's no reason for you to lose heart. There's no reason for you to lose faith. There's no reason for you to turn away from God just because he doesn't say anything. He doesn't mean that he doesn't know before there is a word on your tongue. Jesus said, he knows what you're going to say. So the New Testament affirms and confirms what David is saying in the psalm. Before you even speak, he knows what you're going to say. If you read Matthew 6, where Jesus teaches us how to pray, what do you find? Jesus teaching us, our Father who art in heaven. But with that prayer comes the words of Christ that says, you know, before you even go into your prayer closet, before you say anything, he already knows what the request is, and he's already giving you an answer. If you're struggling with anything, and you think the Almighty doesn't know, he knows. If you're struggling with anything, and you think that it's overwhelming, it's too much for me to bear. This sin that I'm caught in, this trespass that has me overloaded, this difficulty that seems to be more than life. And yet David says, you know everything. Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, thou dost know it all. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. We go to school. We study to get a 4.0 and come out with a 2.5. Is it because we didn't study hard enough? Is it because the material is too difficult? Not necessarily. But we don't walk away with all the knowledge that our professors and our teachers want to give us. So we walk away with half of that knowledge, which is better than nothing. And yet God knows it all. Then David focuses on the fact that God is everywhere. He says, where can I go from thy spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed and shield in the netherworld, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn like a bird, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, underwater, even there thy hand will lead me and thy right hand will lay hold of me. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me. And light around me will be night. Even the darkness is not dark to thee. And the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to thee. He's everywhere. He sees everything. If you go on top of the mountain, he's there. If you go under the water, he's there. If you go into the darkest part of the earth, it's like light to him, like bright day. There's absolutely nowhere we can go where God's presence is not there. He knows everything, and he's everywhere. So if we go into the universe, to the second heaven, where the stars 
and the sun and the moon dwell. He is also there. The Bible says, for it's in him that we live and we move and we have our being. He has to be everywhere for all of creation to exist. He has to be everywhere for all of creation to operate the way it should. His presence is power. His presence is authority. His presence is divinity. And you will say, well, I don't see no God. And yet Paul says to the church that we see his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature being understood through what has been made. God wants you and I to understand him. Not to necessarily see him with our naked eyes. He wants you to understand his attributes. It is invisible. You understand that he grows the tree. You understand that he grows the fruit tree. We go, we pick the fruit, and we eat it. You understand that he makes the animals. From Genesis all the way through, he says, kill and eat. It's for us to nourish on. The fields are filled with corn and wheat, rice and beans. Potatoes grow out of the ground. Carrots grow out of the ground. Beets grow out of the ground. God wants you and I to understand it is because of his divine presence that these things grow. It is because of his divine presence that you and I are walking on the face of the earth. It is because of his divine presence that we have life. For it is in him that we live and we move and we have our being. So just because you and I cannot see God with our naked eyes, it doesn't mean that he doesn't know what's going on. It doesn't mean that he doesn't see or he's not present. If we are caught in a situation which, is, which leads to death or judgment, he is right there. Just because he's not opening mouth and saying something about what is happening, it doesn't mean that he doesn't know. It doesn't mean that he's not there. Everything that David went through with Saul, who was the first king of Israel, God knew. Every time David sinned with Bathsheba, God knew. Every time David won a war, God knew, and he was there helping David. So it is with us who believe and who are reconciled to him. God knows when you're caught in a trespass. God knows when you're caught in a bad situation. God sees what you're going through. He's not blind. If we see it and they televise it, how much more the Lord whose presence fills all of heaven and all of earth. This is a normal American thinking. But it is a fact that has to be said. This isn't how we think in America. We don't think about a living God. We don't think about a righteous God. We don't think about a God whose presence is everywhere. In America, we don't even give thought to God. We have our television shows. We do more talking to each other than we do to the Almighty because we think that there is no Almighty there watching us, listening to us, and knowing what we're dealing with. But David doesn't stop at the presence and omniscience of God. He says in verse 13, For thou didst form my inward parts, thou didst weed me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are thy works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from thee when I was made in secret. Thine eyes have seen my unformed substance, and as I took, they were all written. The days that were ordained for me, when I kissed, there was not one of them. Thou didst form my inward parts. You formed my guts and my stomach, my intestines and my heart, my ribs and my bones, my skeleton. You formed the blood, the veins, the meat that is inside of me, my sex, 
as a male or a female. My brain and my eyes. David's testimony is, you made the whole thing. Your divine power has made all of me. Your divine power have created me, formed me in your image, as indicated in Genesis 1, 26, 27. So the God of David is an all-knowing, omnipresent, all-powerful God who has created every single one of us by His power, by the power of His hands. How many people here went through the nine-month period? How many people have forgotten the nine-month period? Nine months in a woman's womb. Nine months in a woman's womb to be created. Here you are in the stomach of a woman while God is making your inside. How does he do that? How does God form you inside of a woman's belly and to put inside of you your own stomach, your own skeleton, your own guts, your own eyes, your own sex? How does he do that in the body of a woman? That is the reality that we forget as people that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And we go about our work being busy all the time, doing whatever it is that we need to do. But what do we forget? The one who has made us. The one who has called us into this life. The one who has created us in his image. My frame was not hidden from thee when I was made in secret. You see, God is the God of secrecy. What he does in the womb is a secret. Ask the infant, how were you created? Ask the infant, how you were made? Ask the infant, why did he choose to make you in this woman's body instead of another woman's body? Why did he choose to make you inside of this race rather than this race? Why did he choose to bring you into this family rather than this other family? How does God do it? What kind of mystery is this? What kind of miracle is this? What kind of power does this? Even inside of a woman, God can is doing these things. And yet, man says there is no God. But David doesn't stop there. At acknowledging the power of God, he says, How precious also are thy thoughts to me. Oh God, how vast is the sum of them. The thought of God enters the mind of David. God numbers our days. God knows everything about us. God is everywhere that we are. In danger or in safety, he is there. In faith and outside of faith, he is there. Just because God is silent, it doesn't mean that he doesn't know and his power is diminished. David says, If I should tell them, they would outnumber the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. Oh, that thou would slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me. Therefore, men of bloodshed, For they speak against thee wickedly, and thy enemies take thy name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate thee, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against thee? I hate them with the utmost hatred. They have become my enemies. God has enemies on earth. How can the most powerful God, all-knowing God, omnipresent God, have enemies? Who among us can stand against this living God who formed us? How is it that we are the enemy of our Creator? Is our sin more important to us? How is it that we are the enemy who are who is over against the one who has secretly made us in our mother's womb? How is it that we are the enemy of the God who called us into this life? How is it that we are the enemy? And yet David says, I hate them because they are your enemies. The same way you hate them, I hate them. 
the same way they want to live in sin and immorality and homosexuality and murder and stealing and lying and destroying each other in war and on and on and on and all the sins of the world David says, I hate them all. Verse 23, he says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. And see if there is any hurtful way in me. And lead me in the everlasting way. What was David's conclusion after this song? What was David's conclusion? He calls God to search him. He calls God to look into his heart. He calls God to know his thoughts. Search me, O oh God. Know my heart. Try me. In other words, test me. And know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any hurtful way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. God, if you find any wickedness in me, if you find any wretchedness in me, if you find me as an enemy, if you find me as one of the rebel risers, or rebel rousers, if you find me to be unbelieving, if you find me to be one who is an enemy, lead me in the everlasting way. Lead me out of this enemy status. Lead me away from this danger. Lead me. Shouldn't that be the prayer of every single one of us on planet Earth? That God should search us, that God should know us, and that God would lead us in the everlasting way. Isn't what is not what we just celebrated at Easter? Jesus, the everlasting power of God. Jesus, the Savior who came and died on the cross for our sins. Jesus, who was the Messiah. Jesus, who says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Jesus, who rose on the third day. Jesus, who says, stop sinning. Jesus, who says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. Jesus, who we're about to celebrate in six months time at Christmas. So David says, lead me in the everlasting way. Jesus who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus who says, there is no other. There is no other way but through me. If those are the truths of God's word, shouldn't we be doing what David does, acknowledging the omnipresence of God, acknowledging the power of God, and acknowledging the presence of God. Just because you and I don't see Him, it doesn't mean He's not there. Just because we can't see Him with our naked eyes, it doesn't mean that He's not aware of what we're dealing with, of the threats against us because of the faith that we profess. Men who make nuclear power have nothing on God. Men who war against nations and destroy those nations have nothing on God. Men who travel in outer space and back have nothing on God because the number of their days has been numbered by God. So then what is the purpose of this message? To remind you to ask God to speak, to search, and to lead. Search me, God, and lead me, God. What does it say in Psalm 23? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides restful water. He restores my soul. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou hast prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And my cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Who doesn't want to go in the everlasting direction that God leads? Who doesn't want to repent of sin? 
who doesn't want to yield to an all-knowing, all-present God, all-powerful God. I certainly don't want to go up against him face to face. I hope we are wise and discerning in this generation. I hope we are wise and discerning in this generation. And take him at the foot of the cross. And take Jesus as Lord and God. Will you come to Jesus this afternoon? Will you turn to Jesus in salvation? Will you give the everlasting God his due respect and come clean with him? If you want to do that, you simply have to open your mouth and pray and exercise faith, believing that he hears you, believing that he knows you, believing that he sees you, believing that it is by the power of his hand that you exist and you move and you have life on his earth. You simply say, Father, forgive me for my sin. Father, forgive me for the evil of my way. Father, I repent of all the threats and all the evil that I have done. Father, I repent. Bless me with your Holy Spirit. I believe that Jesus is Lord and God. Bless me with your everlasting Spirit. Lead me to eternal life. Open my eyes so that I may see your attributes. Open my mind so that I may understand your word. In Jesus' name, amen. God is not as far away from us as you think. In some people, he abides in them by stealing them through the Holy Spirit. Do not go face to face with God. You will lose. You will lose. When you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, you will not be able to stand to look at him eyeball to eyeball. If you can't look at the sun that's above us and see the roundness of it, how much more is the sin of God? If you can't look at the flashlight that he's given to us, how much more is the Son of God who is upholding the flashlight, who is upholding the sun, and all the stars that are out there. If you can't look at that light, how much more the light of the world and the salt of the earth. Amen.